All right, Aspire Leaders and Teach Better family, thank you so much for joining this week. I have a special guest. Grace Stevens is a brand new addition to the Teach Better Podcast Network. I'm going to jump into that celebration now, Grace, and just let folks know that you have a phenomenal podcast, one that I'm very proud of uh, to be associated with with our podcast network that's growing. And uh, well, first off, thank you so much for being on the Aspire to Lead podcast. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Yes, Grace, I've got to learn a little bit about you as you know your journey, and I would love for you to just to share out kind of all the wonderful things that you're doing, and then how did you get to the, the point you are currently? Okay, so currently I will call myself a teacher empowerment coach, and yeah. I work full-time helping educators have a more positive experience. So whether that's teachers in the classroom, um, admin, support staff, whatever, whatever cap capacity you are in education, I'm here to help you have a more positive experience with the kids you got, with the admin you got, not like putting that off for like, oh yeah, when I have the dream class, the dream class isn't coming. So that's what I do currently. And um, it was a bit of um, a different um, path getting here. I'm a second career teacher. I was um, having an amazing career in the corporate world. It was what I thought I was supposed to be doing. Um, I was the first person in my family um, ever to, you know, go to university, do all those things, got on the corporate track, made all the money, just had all the um, kind of the stuff that went with that and um, had a young family, was in my mid-30s and uh, was miserable, honest to goodness, uh, just really stressed, overwhelmed, overcommitted, no boundaries, constantly guilt-ridden, never gave enough at home, never gave enough at work, like just it, it was very, I felt like I had created this amazing life but I didn't participate in it and I needed something different so um, I took a really big change I decided my childhood dream had always been to be a, a public school teacher went back to school started teaching at a title one school loved it was amazing checked all the boxes for me it had connection it had purpose it was fun um, I got to spend you know weekends and holidays with my own children and I thought I was set for life. And um, lo and behold, within two years, I'd recreated the same circumstances for myself. Overwhelmed, no boundaries, people pleasing, uh, feeling guilty. I wasn't giving enough. It, it, it all came crashing back, that stress, that anxiety. Honest to goodness, did not have another career change in me. Um, and so I decided, you know, part of the problem was me. Um, and so let's fix that. So I went into this deep dive on my own personal mission to kind of realize how to hack my own happiness and did a lot of studying, a lot of courses, a lot of books, a lot of seminars and um, figured out a framework for myself to have a better experience. And then other teachers noticed and asked me about it. And um, and so then I put that into a framework and a book. And, and so the book is Positive Mindset Habits for Teachers. Um, I had written several books before that, but not really about teaching. I kind of kept that separate. But then, um, so that's what I did. So anyway, after 20 years in the classroom, I always said I wanted to be a public servant for 20 years. So after 20 years, which saw me all the way through COVID and post COVID, goodness, what an adventure. Um, I decided that this kind of last chapter now, my third act is going to help. I could have more impact really helping more teachers have a positive experience. So that's kind of the long and short of where I am. So I stepped out the classroom at the end of 2022. Sure. Yeah, you've seen a great deal in those 20 years uh, with, yeah. within education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Just the technology alone. Oh, you right. Know, just, just like, you know, the overhead projectors and such. Um, yeah, no, it has been, um, yeah, it's been a lot. But it's been interesting. But you know what? The stuff that I still was so passionate about from the day I left, from the day I started, had not changed. And that was believing in the potential of education to change the world. Yeah. And particularly, uh, you know, public education, a free education, equitable education for everybody, mm -hmm. seeing potential in students, helping them um, believe in themselves and their own success, like none of that. The, the real core, even though there's been so much, you know, noise and, and uh, kind of um, just different ways in which we told to present things and do things and then technology, but the real 
fundamentals of why I wanted to be an educator are still there. And yeah. I still believe in their capacity um, to help have a very, a, a large impact and a rewarding career. Mm -hmm. Well, Grace, you had touched on your book, which I'm so excited about, uh, yeah. Positive Mindset Habits for Teachers. So let's kind of dive into that as kind of our baseline of our conversation, because okay. I, I want to know about the concept of the book, but then also, you know, and you kind of touched on this a little bit of, as the why, but like, how is that going to help our teachers and our leaders that are listening, you know, for them reading that resource? Okay. So the first thing is, you know, I wrote that book five years ago. And so now I have a bit more of a clearer framework. It was based on another book I'd written years before called The Happy Habit, which was all the science of like how we... Um, can hack our brains to be happier. And I think it's a much bigger conversation these days and it's an easier conversation to have because now that, you know, everybody is familiar and kind of on board with the idea of growth mindset, right? So the intelligence isn't fixed. I don't have to convince anybody of that anymore. Well, it turns out that your happiness standpoint isn't fixed either. So in that book, at the very beginning, I dig into the science, which is that only, you know, so some of us, you know, some of us are glass half full, people some are glass half empty I like to think I'm a the glass is refillable but um, you know genetically we're kind of dealt some kind of predisposition right in so but so 40 percent of it is genetics and I did not win that lottery like my background family background is is not there's a lot of anxiety depression things we struggled with um, so that's only 40 percent though actually 50, sorry, 50%, 10%, only 10% is our circumstances. And I know a lot of people like, that's crazy. It's true. It's scientifically validated. People much smarter than me have proven that. A lot of research out of Harvard on that. A lot more acceptance of that these days. So the part I focus on is that 40%, 40% of your happiness quotient comes down to intentional habits and practices. And so um, the book is based on positive mindset habits. So kind of where my, I want to say my kind of like niche, my zone of genius is, is like these aren't, you know, I didn't do the research. I'm not a researcher, um, but I've taken all that research and integrated it. How does that come to play in a classroom? Because we spend so much time in our classrooms. And how can we have practices that integrate um the students too, because then you know you're going to be held accountable if the kids are doing it too. Um, how do we make it simple, easy, all the practices? Um, none of them cost any money. You can do them in less than five minutes a day. And But a lot of it starts with mindset. And so even though it's simple, you know, it's not easy. You've got years of conditioning to um, kind of overcome. You've got years of uh, biological evolution. You know, our brains have developed over time to keep us safe right not necessarily keep us happy <laughs> so there's that whole piece to do with our nervous system and as we know being in a classroom is literally an assault on your nervous system right there's so much stuff going on um yeah i taught second grade for a long time and the um the best i ever got anyone to hear describing it was it's like being pecked to death by by geese right isn't that really just if you teach them with littles um but any age that you're dealing with so anyway so that was the foundation of the book it looked at 10 um 10 kind of mindsets and then at the end of the it gives the science for it i'm a little bit on the nerd science um but then it breaks it down into practical terms here are some habits you can do so that's kind of um what the book was that particular awesome book yeah. Right. So let's talk about the science a little bit because you've touched on kind of like a pie chart of happiness. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I love for you to dive a little bit deeper. Uh, and maybe this is just the nerd inside of me, but I always get excited with data and, and science in regards to these things, because, you know, there are a lot of people I talk to all the time, especially leaders that are stressed and, and are not finding happiness, especially mm -hmm. at this time of the year, um, where, you know, in the spring where there's so many things to do, <laughs> you're looking already to the next year and uh, feeling mm -hmm. that added pressure um, in a lot of different facets. So um, I'd love to learn a little bit more in regards to the science of happiness. Okay, so if you look at the basic, right, really foundational building blocks of um, positive psychology, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we all had to take psychology 101 at some point, you know, my, my formal schooling is, you know, decades behind me now. But, um, you know, oh, I have to edit out that noise. Um, 
really the boy, building blocks um, for a happy life, if we want to say, are going to be having purpose. Okay, well, you got that in school, right? Connection. You know, there's a lot of work these days um, on the blue zones, right? On the, the areas in the world where people live to um, the longest, right? And of course, part of that is, you know, diet and, and other things and exercise. But but the the kind of the other side of that is they all look at and it is these building blocks is foundation is uh, purpose, is connection, um, occupational self direction. Now, a lot of that, unfortunately, if you work in a district and you're a teacher that um, has a very scripted curriculum and a real stickler for an admin, everybody on the same page on the same day, right? Like, so a lot of that I find, especially over the two decades that I taught, a lot of that, it was a struggle to maintain that, that creativity, that spark, right? Um, the idea of flow of getting deeply involved in work. And I found it very easy, it used to be easier when there were fewer devices, um, technology in the classroom, but to get in that zone with the kids where you're learning and you all those things. So the, the building blocks are there inside the classroom. Um, again, as far as the brain science goes, um, a lot of what I work on with people when I'm helping coach them is this whole mindset piece is, well, I have this framework. We love ourselves some acronyms, right? So the framework I have, I call it ECHO framework, where the E stands for your energy teaches more than your lesson plans. The C stands for control what you can control, right? When you talk about all the things that are happening, like when you focus on the things you can control, you're a lot happier. Um, the H part is happiness can be synthesized. That's a brain science that I go into that I nerd out on. And the last piece, which I think is really important for teachers, administrators, everybody, is this O, is other teachers' experience doesn't need to be your experience, right? You get to craft your own experience. And one of the reasons that I did end up writing the book was because I worked in a very small school. So we had the same student population. We had the same admin, we had the same resources, or in our particular case, unfortunately, lack of resources, um, the same culture, right? And yet my experience with all those things, I was having a different experience than other people because working on happiness is trying to have a different experience in the situation with which you find yourself, not putting it off for some future thing, right? There's a lot of, you know, you might remember from psychology, hedonic adaptation, right? The hedonic treadmill, like as we overestimate how happy we think certain things are going to make us. Oh, when I have that new car or those new shoes or a different group of students or a different admin or the grade that I really wanted to teach, right? I got pushed around from grade to grade. You know, it was a small school. How many times like, oh, now you're teaching a split. Now you're teaching this. Now you're teaching that, right? You know, I always felt like, oh, if I found my way in the perfect grade, right? So you can't put it off for a future event, for spring break, for the weekend, right? How many educators live for the weekend or spring break or summer break or woe betide for retirement, right? Like, ah, I just got to keep going three more years. Like, that's not productive for people and it's really not productive for students. So basically looking at in the situation in which I find myself right now, what are the things I can focus on in crafting a better experience for myself? And I really feel that for a lot of educators, they feel like, oh, you know, we've been trained culturally uh, and as well as the type of people that education invites, we're helpers, we're fixers. We get into this kind of teacher martyr syndrome, right? Into this some kind of weird competition that we're trying to compare who's working the most, who has the worst kids, who has the most, you know, oh, you think that's something, you should hear about this, right? It's kind of like we up the ante when we talk to people. Um, all of that is not really helping us focusing on what we want, noticing the things that are going right. And students, um, they understand our, our energy, right? They, they, they know the difference between a teacher and an admin who is just kind of trying to get through the day, who is low-key resentful because they're exhausted, they overcommitted themselves, um, 
they're getting pulled in a million directions and they know the difference between that and um, a leader or a teacher who shows up, maybe not with the most perfect lesson plans you've ever seen with the best graphics and, you know, Pinterest worthy or whatever, but they show up, they're excited to be there, they believe in kids, they believe in education, um, they're looking at possibilities, not all the problems. The problems are there, oh my God, we know what the problems are. And, um, but when we just focus on them, we feel so powerless to actually make progress with them. And so that's really what we look at is looking at, you know, confirmation bias, all, all those things. Like your brain is set up to um, filter out things. Um, there's too much sensory input, especially in a classroom. And you've trained your brain to filter in the stuff that you think is important. So if you think what's important is that one kid who's dysregulated and not the other 29 who are, you know, helping each other and, uh, and all those things, I mean, you've got to deal with the dysregulated kid. you got to be, you know, calm, consistent, consequences and move on. But don't have your radar set for that gotcha. Like as soon as that kid scratches their nose, you're like, oh, here it goes, here it's coming, right? You kind of ramp yourself up, right? Your kids know that energy and they behave accordingly. I mean, there's a scientific term for that, co-regulation. I don't want to nerd everybody out, but it's simpler just to remind myself, hey, what am I tuned into here, right? My energy is teaching more than my lesson plans, so. I love that. Well, it's a beautiful <laughs> framework, Grace, that you've got with ECHO and um, definitely empowers our educators. I want you had touched on real quick uh, about habits in the classroom. Uh -huh. I know it's your book is chock full of a variety of of different things in regards to habits. So, is there one or two that you want to touch on just to kind of help our educators and um, you know to be yeah. with the science of happiness and all? <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. Sorry. Let me grab it. <clears throat> Okay, so one powerful habit is um, kind of acting what I call like to be a joy detective, right? When you are, you're dealing with conditioning, you're dealing with habit, you're dealing with, you have 90,000 thoughts a day, no wonder we're exhausted. Guess what? 90% of them are the same thoughts you had yesterday, and they're not terribly positively focused. So it takes intention, right? It's a, oh, it sounds so simple. Simple is not the same as easy. It takes intention. So one real simple practice I have is to encourage, and it's easier to phrase it as like being a joy detective when you have little kids, right? Because they're used to being, you know, looking at the text, be a detective, find the text evidence. <laughs> now we're going to, in the everyday life and in the classroom, we're going to look for evidence that things are going well. So maybe for the kids, you just have a joy jar, which is basically any kind of container you have. And the kids have little slips of paper that when something goes well, or somebody helped them or something they're happy about, they write the little note, they slip it in the joy jar. Easy, right? And then when the energy in the room is a little low or, you know, when something isn't going well and instead of flogging it like a dead horse because, oh, my God, I have to teach social studies until this time. You know, nobody's got the lesson. Nobody's getting it. People are checked out. Like, stop. Do something else, right? Come back and do it tomorrow. That's a perfect time to say, who wants, hey, spin the wheel. Who wants to go grab something at the joy jar? Okay, so tr you can train kids to do that. You can train yourself, right? Every time. You leave the classroom. I used to have a habit from a neuro-linguistic programming standpoint called a pattern interrupt, like I would touch the door frame on the way out, and that would be my reminder between here and the office or wherever I was going many times a day, I'm going to look for five things that I like and I'm going to find them. That's it. I would just, instead of worrying about, uh, oh, God, that email, that, per that parent needs this or is the coffee machine going to be jammed or is the coffee going to be empty and nobody filled it out, right? Just like walking across campus, let me just look. Right, let me set my radar. And I will notice a kid tying another kid's shoe. I will notice, you know, two yard duties laughing, right? I'll notice the good stuff. Like you just got to fill up your own tank. But to take that to the next level, something that I find is really helpful for people is to have a kind of closing ritual. One of the things I find teachers and um, educators all struggle most with is separating work and home, 
right? Even if we manage to set epic boundaries and we're leaving school at a reasonable time, if we're not even physically just dragging all our stuff with it, it used to be we dragged those teacher's manuals. They were so heavy, right? Your teachers had a cart. Now it's all online. So like you don't have to physically drag it home, but emotionally, cognitively, we're dragging it all home with us, right? And that kid that annoyed us all day, that parent, that coworker that we so need a break from, you might as well have invited them to dinner because that's what you're talking about, right, when you get home, right? So we want, we want a way to, to have this ritual that separates in our brain, tells us I'm done with the day. So for me, it was always clearing up my desk, take a big stick. No, a pink stick, no, just write three things. First three things I need to do in the morning. So that's number one. We would kind of just mentally, hey, I'm set. I need, I know what I need to do in the morning. I don't need to check my emails when I get home or anything else. But the other thing is write down the three best parts of your day. It takes less than five minutes. Why the three best parts of your day? Well, one, all day you're going to set your radar. You start to play a game with yourself. Like, huh, is this going to be my top three? Is that going to be my top three? You're going to start noticing good stuff. Then by writing it down, we know that creates new neural pathways in your brain. Like, yeah, sometimes some people are like, oh, I don't have time to write stuff down. I used to sometimes snap a picture of something I really loved, a piece of work a kid had done or something, whatever. But the fact that you're writing it down, it's there in your mind. It's top of mind. Firstly, it's telling you you're done with the day. I'm closing out the day. Here was the best stuff that happened. I have my three things I need to do in the morning. Not going to worry about that. And then when I get home, firstly, you're more positively focused. But then when you get home and somebody asks you, hey, how was your day? Instead of like reliving the worst of it, you're going to say the good stuff because that's what you just thought about. So that seems so kind of simple, but it is really effective. Um, just to get into that habit of writing down the best three parts of your day. And it came from a ritual I had with my kids when I used to tuck them in we go to bed. We would always talk about our three favourite parts of the day. Um, and so I developed that to, like I said, just a closing ritual. But you can get the kids involved. Sometimes, you know, we all have exit tickets and sometimes the exit ticket needs to be, you know, what did you learn or all these things. But like once a week, once every couple of weeks, my exit ticket is tell me something awesome that happened today. Like nobody's getting out the room before they told me something awesome that happened that day. I think it also helps with when the parents say, what did you learn at school today? And the kids are like nothing right <laughs> it's better that, that they can say oh well this happened today right they need the good stuff top of mind too grace is so like you're in my house that's, yeah. that's exactly the response i get from my yeah kid. what'd you learn today nothing <laughs> like really really tell me that's about funny. that yeah yeah it is yeah. Pretty, that's well pretty grace universal. you had said, you had said simple but i think simple is great that's just, it's, it's exactly what we need for our administrators and leaders because as you know uh, they they have extremely busy lives and, you know, to have something really, really complicated is probably something that yeah. is hard to implement, but something as simple as just a mindset change like that and, and looking for just three things. I mean, it's just three things yeah. um, is, is a, a wonderful and brilliant um, way to, to change your mindset. So I want to touch on your projects that you've got going on um, before we, we end with a couple questions here. Uh, I had mentioned your podcast mm -hmm. and it would, I'd be remiss not to bring it back up because it's a brilliant piece of content that I want people to jump on their podcast application and to subscribe to, which is balance your teacher life. Uh, will you just share a little bit about, you know, why you created that and, and who you built that podcast for? All right. So I built it for people to listen to the episodes are between some of some of them get a little over 30 minutes, but some of them are very short. Um, you know, you can listen on your prep period or whenever, um, and you commute. And it is to help, it's to give very practical strategies. So there's a lot of mindset set stuff, but there are very practical strategies to help people who want to have a more balanced life in education. It is very, very typical that teachers' lives are out of balance. And when people say, oh, work-life harmony, like, no, it needs to be an integration and it needs to be intentional. Um, I find that educators, you know, try and do everything and that's really not possible. And we need to have like some really good um, tools, skills, frameworks to really evaluate, what am I not gonna do this week? You're not gonna get everything done. Well, what's gonna be the biggest paybacks for the biggest stakeholders? 
who are the students? <laughs> um, so it is um, a lot of stuff um, on how to set boundaries. How do you say no in a student focused way that you feel good about that other people aren't gonna, you know, start thinking, oh, they're lazy or they're this, you know, all those kind of weird misperceptions, whatever. So um, I do have guests once in a while, um, but a lot of it is my own content going through, um, like I said, setting boundaries, um, psychology of happiness, and it is all, okay, the biggest compliment I got, somebody said it was the biggest, uh, the greatest, um, what did they, how did they phrase it? The perfect integration of woo and practicality. So, you know, I'm not for everybody. Um, I am all about empowerment, though. It's, like, it's not about toxic positivity. Like, there are so many issues in education I don't ever want to you know, disvalid and validate people's experience. But given all of that, what can I still control, right? Because we start to feel powerless. And so it's a lot of that. But there are shorty episodes. I have bonus episodes called uh, Lunchbox Love Notes, which are just like well, five, 10 minute episodes, usually on a Sunday, a little kind of note of inspiration for somebody um, that I trust the universe will deliver to them right when they need to hear it. So um, yeah, it's Balance Your Teacher Life. And it was actually that name is, I have a signature course where I work um, with educators um, and coach them and do different things, which is a little bit more than just in the classroom. It's really um, phrased as kind of be the hero in your own teaching story. Like I, I guide people through it, but a lot of it, I also have a background in um life coaching and emotional intelligence. How nerdy is that? So it's a, <laughs> a little bit of that in the course. But I also have quickie courses you can finish in the night, setting better boundaries, protecting your peace, um, mm -hmm. how to say no, the art of saying no. Um, and then I have the books. But, you know, the podcast is an excellent place to start because, of course, you know, it's all free. Yeah, that's a great point. It is a good yeah. place to start, but to go deeper and to get more you know, focus on a certain topic. I love that you have all those courses for folks yeah. also. So um, Grace, I, I would love for my listeners to take an actionable step today. So, you know, they're getting all this wonderful science and mm -hmm. these habits that they can implement into their classroom or into their schools, the framework, and of course, all your resources, but I want them to have an actionable step to enhance their leadership journey. So if there's something you do tomorrow or next week, what would you advise them to do? So I say start here and it's gonna sound wishy-washy but start here just think and decide decide just decide that you being happy you are worthy of being happy and the world needs it that's what i'm going to tell you your energy teaches more than your lesson plans we need positive people it doesn't mean you don't have a bad day that that's not what positivity is but being optimistic and feeling empowered over what happens in your classroom on your campus I like to say when I close my door I'm a revolutionary because yes I listen to all the new initiatives and everything else that comes through but what did I say at the beginning of the podcast has really what has changed in the last two decades changed no, you believe in students, you believe in their potential, you believe in the power of education to positively impact the world. Kids need to learn critical thinking skills, how to evaluate for bias, like none of those, these things are getting increasingly more, you know, um, important. And the only place that some students are going to learn that is inside your classroom. And so I would say the first step is literally just decide, decide if I'm staying in education, I'm going to find a way to feel more empowered and more happy and I'm worthy of that. And if you have to frame that in the context of, oh, because it's better for my students and my campus morale, then do that. But it should be just for you. You are worthy of being happy and make that decision and decide to find the resources. There are so many resources like Yale's most popular class. You can do it online for free, right? Dr. Laurie Sanders, you can go take her class. Like the, the resources are there. Yes, I've put them in a framework. Yes, I give you a map that's easy to follow, but there are a ton of resources out there and decide that that's um, important and then you're going to commit to it. So that's really isn't, you know, 
I don't want to tell people like, oh, go to my website or go do this, go do that. Go do what feels good for you. Go if taking a Yale course sounds good to you. If downloading an app of 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 meditated meditation app or something, but don't let yourself get dragged into this idea that everything is terrible and it's never going to get better because there's so much of that noise out there and it simply isn't true. Look around your campus, see who's having a better time than you. Go hang out with them. That's easy. Mind who you Very hang easy. with. Don't we tell the kids <laughs> that all the time? Mind who you hang with, yep. right? Right. Your results are really, your life is a reflection of the five people you hang out with the most, right? If you're miserable and complaining and just think everything's terrible, who are you hanging with? Mm -hmm. Look around. There's there's people having a better time than you. Go hang with them. Well, Simple. Grace, you had <laughs> said that you didn't want to tell people to go to your website, but I'm going to do that for you. So <laughs> I want folks to go there because I know there's a, a wealth of information and resources. Uh -huh. So will you just share that with them? And then if... You know, someone wants to connect with you on social media, yeah. we share that out also. So I got to tell you, I am really not great at social media. Um, it's one of the things, no, it's, no, it, that's by intention. I, I, I know, like, really, how you ever expecting to connect with people i find it's pretty damaging to my mental health i'm sure. really careful about my mental health so but yeah. one place everybody can go is gracestevens.com forward slash happy there's a free video training there on the five habits of the most empowered happiest least stressed teachers and i don't know anybody in education who doesn't want to be happier and least less stressed so that's a really easy place to start gracestevens.com forward slash happy or the podcast balance your teacher life which yes is on the teach better network and um there'll be links in there in fact that journal um, that i talked about the prompts the three things like i have a um a journal i have a six week free version you can get when you go to the show notes of the podcast maybe i can give it to you and you can put it in your notes um, yeah and um so there's all kinds of free resources available but that's it so it's stevens with the v that's the only thing people sometimes get lost so s-t-e-v-e-n-s -E beautiful and we'll have that link in the show notes we'll have it on joshtamper.com um of course you know as far as the spelling of grace's last name if you're on youtube it's very simple because it's on the screen it's right on the screen <laughs> it's yeah. right on the screen for us um and of course if you're watching on youtube please make sure that you're subscribing joshua stamper is the channel or you can go over to the teach better team youtube page that's a growing community also and and you can find this episode and many more on there grace you're doing some phenomenal things all over education all over this country I am so proud of the podcast that you have and that it's connected to the Teach Better team. So thank you for all that you do and, and for joining me here today on Aspire to Lead. Oh, thank you so much. And I appreciate you and your work so much too. So it has been my absolute pleasure.